All right, we'll go ahead and get started then. Uh, we're studying Galatians. We'll be in Galatians 3, but if you would, let's start in 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. And 1 Corinthians 10, we're told that the Old Testament stories are there for our examples. And a lot of times these stories that are here are just relegated to children's church and they're seen there as good stories and you can get something out of it. But uh, there's so much more once we know the truth of Paul's epistles and the mystery doctrine. Um, these stories really come to life and we get a lot of spiritual application in them. And where Paul is in Galatians 3... It relates to this story that we have in 1 Samuel 28. So we're going to read this story first, and I think it will be easier for us to understand what Paul is talking about in Galatians 3. So we'll pretty much read the whole chapter here. So start in verse 1, 1 Samuel 28 and verse 1. Uh, by this time, I should say a little background God had anointed Saul as the king of Israel, and uh, in, I believe it's either chapter 15 or 16, Saul had disobeyed God. He had told him to utterly destroy the people there, and he did not do so. And so through the prophet Samuel, Saul was removed as God's anointed. He says that you're not my king, and then I'm going to put someone else in there. And then uh, God, through Samuel, has David anointed as king. Saul, though, continues to act as if he's king this entire time. And so when we get to 1 Samuel 28, Samuel, the prophet, has already died. God has anointed David as king, but Saul uh, is still acting as the official king. The people of Israel have not recognized David as their king yet. Saul is the one over them. Uh, so with that background, we see in 1 Samuel 28, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I, keep, will I make thee keeper of mine head forever. Uh, Achish is over the Philistines. David is with the Philistines at this time. He's not with Saul and his band in Israel. <clears throat> so in verse 3, uh, it says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Uh, these familiar spirits, wizards or witches, or whatever you want to call them, in the book of the law, in Genesis through Deuteronomy, God had specifically said, that those who seek familiar spirits, the wizards or the witches, are to be, be put to death. That's a, that's a uh, sin that is punishable by death under God's law. And so Saul, according to verse 3, there had put away those people. Verse 4 says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Well, the reason that God wouldn't answer him is he's no longer God's anointed. God has already told him through Samuel that because you disobeyed me, I'm replacing you with someone else. God has already had Samuel anoint David as king. So since he is not king anymore, according to God, God does not answer Saul. And so then verse 7, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went. Two men with him, they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Uh, there's a discussion here. And then in verse 11 it says, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? 
And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyedest not the voice of the Lord, nor executeth his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So basically, the summary of all of this is that God had anointed Saul as king over Israel. Saul disobeyed uh, when uh, not utterly destroying the Amalekites. And so God removed Saul as king. He put David in there to replace him. But Saul is still acting as the king. And he doesn't want to believe that he's no longer God's anointed, even though God won't speak to him because he's not the king anymore. So then Saul says, well, I'm going to find a way that I can get out of this and I can defeat the Philistines. So then he calls Samuel up from the dead. And Samuel, from the dead, pretty much tells Saul the exact same thing that God had told him back in 1 Samuel 15. That you're not God's anointed anymore. You disobeyed. The kingdom has been taken from you. It's been given to David. And now um, <clears throat> you're going to be destroyed as a result. So... That's the story there. So now, with that in mind, let's go over to Galatians chapter 3. That's what we're studying today, Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to see how it's very similar as far as what's going on with the Galatians compared to what Saul did and called up Samuel there in 1 Samuel chapter 28. We know that the Galatians, as we've talked in previous weeks, their problem is that they were justified by faith by the faith of Jesus Christ. They believed on that. They have eternal life. But then they had these Judaizers coming in and they were telling them, you've got to be circumcised and you've got to obey the law of Moses or else you're not going to be saved. You're going to lose your salvation. And sadly, we've got a lot of people today trying to put people under the law doing a similar thing. So Paul is trying to tell the Galatians, stop going back to that which is dead, the law, and start living in faith. And in Galatians 2, verse 19, just before, a few verses before Galatians 3, Galatians 2, verse 19, Paul makes this statement. He says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. We talked about that last week, how because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law perfectly, becoming a curse for us, that we have eternal life through Him, and as a result, He's put away the law, we are dead to the law. We are under grace now and not under the law. The Galatians, though, are doing exactly what Saul did. Saul is dead to being God's anointed, so to speak. He doesn't believe that, so then he pulls up, he brings up something that is dead. He brings up Samuel from the dead and has the dead talk to him. And the dead says to, to Saul... The exact same thing that God said through His Word back in 1 Samuel 15. Paul is going to do the same thing now. The Galatians have called... We saw in Galatians 2.20 that the Galatians are dead to the law. But because of the people who have come in and tried to bring up the law, they have taken the law, taken it from the dead, raised the law from the dead, and are now trying to follow the law. So what Paul is going to do is now he's going to use the law to show to them that, that they should live by faith and not by the law. Just like in 1 Samuel 28, when Samuel was raised from the dead, to well, he wasn't raised, he was just, they called him from the dead, I should say, that he gave them the exact same message that God gave in 1 Samuel 15. 
And so we see here, starting in Galatians 3, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Saul called a witch to raise, a witch is someone who raises something from the dead, or calls it from the dead, I should say. Back in 1 Samuel 28, this witch, Saul went to a witch to bring Samuel up from the dead so that he could hear from the dead. And that's what the Galatians have done with the law. The law is dead to them, and they've called it up from the dead. So they have been bewitched. These people who are in their midst are really witches. And you're filling the blank there. <clears throat> Bewitched means that the Galatians were calling the dead law to life. As such, many Christian pastors today are witches. They are witches. Just like with Saul in 1 Samuel 28, Paul will use the dead to communicate the same message to the Galatians as the living does. It's like Samuel said, basically, you're not God's anointed. The kingdom's given to David. That's what he learned earlier. Now, the dead communicates to Saul and says the same exact thing. Well, Paul's going to do that thing. He says, okay, the law is dead to you. You are no longer under the law. You're under grace. But if you want to call the law from the dead, you want to be bewitched, well, we'll see exactly what the law says about how you should live. And we're going to find out that the message of the law to us and the dispensation of grace is the same message that we have um, you know, under grace. It's that we should live by faith and not by the deeds of the law. And so that's what he's going to show. And I said that many Christian pastors today are witches. They don't wear the black pointy hat or have a broomstick or anything like that. Uh, but what they do, unfortunately, is a lot of times they try to get people under the law, whether it's being a member of a church, whether it's tithing, whether it's uh, being water baptized, well, you know, fill in the blank of whatever the religious society tells you. And what they're doing then is they're calling to life the law when it's really dead to us. We're not under the law, we're under grace. So he says there, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Uh, I wrote on your outline, uh, the Galatians, this may have been Paul's first epistle, or it was one of his first probably, couldn't have been written earlier than Acts 15. So this is, um, you know, several years, of course, after Jesus' death. Uh, the Galatians did not physically see Jesus Christ being crucified. That was something that Israel did in Rome. Um, they were not actually there physically at the crucifixion, but yet we're told that in verse 1 here, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you, uh, then what we're told then, what we know then, since they didn't see it physically, and I wrote on your outline that the Galatians saw Jesus Christ's crucifixion by faith. Uh, they saw it spiritually. They saw it through the eyes of faith. Um, that's important to know because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about how we know G we used to know Jesus Christ after the flesh, but now we don't anymore. Um, really, it's that we look at him uh, in the spiritual light that he was crucified for our sins and then raised from the dead. And so then we look at the victory that he won through that um, uh, afterwards. So uh, they saw the crucifixion by faith. And then verse 2 then, it says, This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Well, if we know that they saw Jesus Christ, not physically crucified, but they saw him through faith. Uh, then they received the Spirit, not by the works of the law, but they received it by the hearing of faith. Uh, if you go over to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, uh, you notice he doesn't say in that verse, by the works of the law or by faith. He says, by the hearing of faith. By the hearing of faith. And... In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we've got a good definition of how faith comes about for us. In Romans 10, verse 17. Uh, the context, he's speaking to Israel here, but of course it still applies to us because of faith, how it comes about. Romans 10, 17 says, 
So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Um, so you've got hearing here. And we saw in Galatians 2, verse 2, the hearing of faith. And then if we go down, I'm sorry, in Galatians 3, verse 2, the hearing of faith. And then if we look in Galatians 3 and verse 5, we see that phrase repeated again. The last part of verse 5 says, Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the point I wanted you to see in this phrase, hearing of faith, just like we see in Romans 10, we see it here in Galatians 3, is that hearing of faith shows that faith is not a work. Now that's your fill in the blank there, that hearing of faith shows that faith is not a work. And that's important for us to understand because um, a lot of times people, you know, we make the argument that we're justified by faith. And we saw that last week in Galatians 2, that we're justified by faith. It's not of works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, Salvation is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And people will say, well, you had to work. You know, you had to pray. You had to, you know, become a member of a church. You had to go to the altar. You had to walk an aisle or, you know, they'll throw in these things. But that's what man thinks it's all about. Man trying to throw his work into it. Really, faith has nothing to do with that. You don't have to kneel down at an altar. You don't have to sign up as a member of the church. You don't have to even say a, the sinner's prayer that's out there. All you have to do is recognize that you are not perfect, that all of sin comes short of the glory of God. You recognize that even though you may have done a lot of good deeds in your life, you've still not been a perfect person. And since you didn't match God's perfect standard of holiness, then you are classified then as a sinner, someone who has sinned, and that you need the grace of God to save you. And if you trust in Jesus' death as atonement for your sins, then you have eternal life. And that's not a work. It's really the hearing of faith. You hear that message that Christ died for my sins, and you simply believe it. You don't pray the sinner's prayer. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to sign up as a member of a church. All you have to do is believe. And so then, if all you have to do is believe, and it comes by hearing, you hear the gospel, and you take that in, you say, okay, well, I'm going to believe that. I recognize I'm a sinner, and I have faith in Jesus to save me. Then you have eternal life. So that shows you that faith is not a work. It's important for us to recognize that because if we're saved by faith and faith is not a work, then the life that we live after we have been saved is not by works. And that's the point that Paul is making here in verse 2. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit. That's You received the Spirit when you received eternal life. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And he asked that question again in verse 5. Was it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Since the answer is, well, I received the Spirit, I received eternal life, I received all those blessings that I have in Christ, I received it all by faith and not by works, then the answer is when those Judaizers come in and say, you got to be circumcised, you got to do the law, and today when we're told you got to do all these religious rites, whatever they come up with, we could say, no, no, I wasn't saved by the works of the law. I wasn't saved by anything I did. All I did was I believed it was the hearing of faith. And so if I'm saved by faith, then I am to live by faith as well. It's not by doing all these deeds that you put upon me. I mean, the point is that you couldn't be saved by anything you did. Because he said, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Uh, the answer is, of course not. Because the law says, here's the holy, just, perfect standard that you've got to meet. And none of us could meet that standard. So God has to give you the gift of salvation by faith. So then you receive that gift. Well, you've got the gift. Well, you're still the same. You're still in that same flesh that you had. You still have that same sin nature in you. You haven't, uh, and you're in your flesh, you haven't been any better. Of course, you're better in the inner man because of the gift that God has given you, giving you the spirit. But as far as who you are, your, your flesh and everything, it's still the same. So then how could you, before you couldn't save yourself, so how can you sanctify yourself? You can't do it. That's the point that Paul is making. That's what he's, why he says in verse 3 there, Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So you couldn't be saved by the flesh. 
But are you foolish to think that now that you're saved, that same flesh that couldn't save you is now going to sanctify you and you're going to serve Christ through that flesh? That's a very foolish idea, he says. You've begun in the Spirit. You can't be made perfect by the flesh. Verse 4, Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Verse 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Um, a point that I've put on your outline that I think is important, and we covered last week in chapter 2, he was really going over the... Uh, start in verse 15 there he's talking about how your justification is by faith and not by the works of the law and he makes this point here that because we once we are saved once we have that faith we are placed into the body of Christ and I mentioned we read over in Colossians 3 where it talks about our life is hid in Christ and so then uh, when th then the argument came up uh, and he addresses it in Galatians 2 verse 17 well, if we are in Christ, then, is Christ the minister of sin when we sin? And we went over that last week, and it really shows that, no, that's not true. It's us in our flesh who are the, are the sinners. It's not Christ. And uh, the question there in Galatians 2.17, it says, But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? And, of course, the answer is, God forbid. God objects to that. Uh, Christ isn't the minister of sin. The answer is in verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I might make myself a transgressor. It's me. I'm the transgressor. And since Christ paid for all of my sins, um, Christ isn't the minister of sin. It's just another payment that Christ made for, for my sins that covers that. Uh, so Christ is not the minister of sin. Well, now in Galatians 3, verse 5, we find out what Christ is the minister of. He's not the minister of sin. Rather, he is the minister of the Spirit to us. Galatians 3, 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So you're filling the blank there under chapter 3, verse 5, is that Christ is the minister of the Spirit, not the minister of sin. Christ is the minister of the Spirit, not the minister of sin. Christ paid for our sins. And if we sin while our life is hid in Christ, that payment that He made on the cross applies for that sin. And that, that payment has already been fully made. There's nothing we do to uh, the works of the law, but it's all by faith in Christ and then the faith of Christ which made that payment for us. And so Christ doesn't minister sin to us. He ministers the Spirit to us. And he does that by faith. Now he's going to give an example here, starting in verse 6. An example of Abraham and how he was justified. It says there in verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Um, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Uh, that quote there in verse 6 about Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, that took place in Genesis 15 and verse 6. God made a promise to Abraham and Abraham believed that and he was saved. Abraham didn't have to do the works of the law. And in fact, the point that we'll get to next week, um, down in verse 17, we're told, um, it says, This I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So in Genesis 15, Abraham was justified by faith. He believed the promise that God made to him, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was 430 years later that the law was given to Moses and to really all of Israel there in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 and following there. And so the point is that even Abraham, who is considered by Israel, he's considered uh, the one who is under the law, so to speak, and under the father of Israel because um, they're considered, they would say, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are our fathers. They're the forefathers. But the point that Paul is making is that even Abraham was not justified by the law. 
he was justified by faith because the law that was given to Moses was given 430 years after the promise given to Abraham here in Genesis 15. And so he says there in verse 7 then, Since Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So now, Paul, remember the illustration from 1 Samuel 28, that, that Saul had called from the dead Samuel to give him that information. And the information that Samuel gave was the same that God gave him in 1 Samuel 15. Similarly, the Galatians have called from the dead the law. So Paul says, okay, you want to look at the law? Well, let's see what the law has to say about how you're going to live. And he is going to show now from the law that really, even under the law, God's plan all along is for the justified to live by faith and not by the deeds of the law. Uh, so he says there, going back to Genesis, Genesis 15, that God, that Abraham was counted for, uh, believing God has counted him for righteousness. Now in verse 8, he's going to quote uh, Genesis chapter 12. He says there in Galatians 3, 8, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. A couple of points I put on your outline. The first thing you see there in verse 8, it says, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. I put on there, The scripture can see the future. Um, it's interesting that in Psalm 138, verse 2, we're told that God has magnified the Scripture above all His name. And we think we, in the first hour, we went over the book of Re in Revelation 4, we saw, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and the holiness of, God's, of, of God Himself, and how the four beasts were protecting the throne. Well, if God exalts His Scripture above his own name, uh, then that shows you how that the scripture is holy scripture. We've got on our Bible, you know, it says, or, or at least mine does, it says holy Bible. And, um, you know, that's a whole, and this gets into, and that's not the point of our study, but it gets into the whole version difference thing. And you look at the differences in versions. Well, if God protects his name, holy, holy, holy is his name, such that he's got these four beasts around the throne, and he's making sure that it doesn't mar his holiness, um, how much more then if he's exalted the scripture above his name and we see that the scripture can foresee the future, uh, how much more would he protect the holiness of the scripture uh, so that we know that when we have a King James Bible in our hand, it is the holy scripture without error. If he protects his name, he is certainly, I'm sorry, if he protects uh, his, his name, then he certainly is going to protect his word since his word is exalted or magnified above all his name. So that's just a side point here. And we see that the scripture uh, is alive. It's, it's powerful.